My name is Father Mark Elliot Smith. What a blessing it is to be here in Walsingham, England's Nazareth. One of my favourite cartoons is to be found in a book about wine, written by a well-known writer and critic. It depicts a desert, stretching in all directions, overhead, a sun beats down mercilessly. And in the midst of this desert is a man, staggering from dune to dune. He's clutching a bottle of wine, and he is saying, a corkscrew, a corkscrew. Thirst is, of course, no joking matter. When our throats are parched, when our bodies suffer from dehydration, water is not an optional extra, it's a vital necessity. Without it, we die. On this third Sunday of Lent, we read from the book of Exodus, and the people whom Moses has led out of Egypt are discontented. Well, more than that, they're stranded in inhospitable desert and afraid for their lives. They murmur, why did you bring us to this awful place of thirst and death? On a purely practical level, it is a story of human thirst, pure and simple, as well as a failure to trust in the Lord, or in Moses, his servant. The chapter describes how, in this place, as in so many others, the Lord provides, instructing Moses to strike the rock with his staff, that the people may drink and be satisfied. Psalm 94, which recalls these events, is the first portion of sacred scripture that we read in the recitation of the Divine Office every day. It reminds us not only of the thirst of the people in the desert, but the stubbornness of hearts that refuse to trust in the Lord. Harden not your hearts as at Mareba, as on that day at Massa in the desert, when your fathers tried me, though they saw my work. One can see why this psalm begins the daily prayer of the church. It's a continuous reminder that God provides for us, his people. It's an invitation to renew our trust and hope in him on a daily basis. And yet, how often we forget, how often we harden our hearts against the possibility that God loves us so much that he meets us in desert and dryness and desolation. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, says the psalm. Yes, physical thirst is a serious thing, and at its most extreme, it is life-threatening and inflicts intense physical suffering. It is not surprising, then, that thirst should be a powerful biblical image of our profoundest spiritual needs. The fourth chapter of John's Gospel tells of the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. At the sixth hour, i.e. noon, when the sun is highest and hottest, Jesus interrupts his journey from Judea to Galilee by way of a Samaritan village. Jews and Samaritans were not friends. The enmity between the two was bitter and went back centuries, at least until 722 BC, when the Assyrians conquered Israel and took most of its inhabitants into captive exile, leaving a small remnant behind. When the land was colonised by incomers from various places, such as Babylon, they brought with them their religious practices and idols. Not only did the remaining Jews start worshipping these idols along with the God of Israel, they also married into the families of the newcomers. To make matters worse, the southern kingdom, Judea, suffered a similar fate at the hands of Babylon about 120 years later. And 70 years after that, a number were allowed to return to rebuild Jerusalem, something that the Samaritans in the north bitterly opposed. Subsequent events served only to intensify the loathing between the two nations. The prophet Nehemiah expelled one of the high priests, Eliashib, from Jerusalem 
for marrying a non-Jewish woman. Eliashib then built another temple on Mount Gerizim, which was then destroyed in the Maccabean Wars by the Jews. The Samaritans were more than capable of acts of vandalism of their own, such as desecrating the temple sanctuary with human bones. So you can see that the hatred and suspicion, which the passing of the years did absolutely nothing to heal, were baked in, and nor were they helped by the geography of the region. So, for instance, if you wanted to travel in the most direct way possible from Jerusalem to Galilee, you would pass through Samaria. Instead, most, if not nearly all Jews, would have bypassed it to the east of the River Jordan, adding a considerable loop to their journey to do so. But Jesus, however, did not do this. Instead, he chose to go into hostile territory and elected to stop hungry, tired and thirsty at Jacob's well near the city of Sychar, which many have identified as Shechem, where Jacob built an altar to the Lord. Against the backdrop of this ancient enmity, a remarkable and life-changing encounter takes place at the sixth hour, about noon, in scorching heat. It's almost as if Jesus knew that this would happen. A Samaritan woman, on her own, comes to the well, meets Jesus, and a conversation takes place, and he addresses her and asks for a drink. The first thing that needs to be said is that it's remarkable that any kind of exchange would even begin, much less continue. Not only would it be unthinkable for a rabbi to speak to an unaccompanied woman, much less would such an exchange take place between a Jew and a Samaritan. But this is Jesus. Not surprisingly, the woman is taken off her guard. In fact, we can even imagine that, as she approached the well, she realised with a mixture of dismay and horror that this stranger was a Jew and that this encounter was unlikely to end well. After all, she probably only came because she thought there would be nobody around. The last thing she probably expected to see was a solitary Jew sitting near the well. So her initial and rather prickly response, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria, has, to my ears at least, a real undercurrent of nervous tension. At first, there is a deep misunderstanding on the part of the woman. First, of who Jesus actually is and what he is actually offering, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you streams of living water. Because she has not yet begun to recognise this stranger for who he is, the woman mistakes the nature of what Jesus is offering, thinking of it simply as a never-ending supply of ordinary water and relieving her of the chore of making the arduous daily noontime journey. As miraculous as that would be, that makes Jesus no more than either a wonder worker or a civil engineer far in advance of the technology then currently available. But as the dialogue unfolds, there is a glimmer of a thaw on the part of the woman towards Jesus, and it begins when he makes reference to her husband, leading to the revelation that, for whatever reason, five husbands have preceded the man currently in her life. But rather than take offence at Jesus for lifting the lid on her eventful past life, she seems prepared to lay down arms, and we can detect the beginnings of a new and guarded curiosity about this stranger. She now recognises that Jesus is no ordinary man. At the very least, 
she perceives a level of prophetic insight and understanding. And this allows her to start the process of putting aside her prejudices and hard-baked hostilities. Perhaps we even see the stirrings of self-understanding and a sense of thirst, not for water, but healing, redemption and new life. We might pause here for a moment and ask ourselves why, when most people would have performed this task either in the cooler hours in the morning or evening, she made this daily journey in the unrelenting heat at a time when most people were not around. Was it because that she knew that this was the only time she wouldn't have to see other people, people who looked down on her, talked about her, judged her? How refreshing then to meet someone who appeared to understand her and to know her as well as she knew herself. What more insights might she gain as she talks with Jesus and begins to see as the mists of misunderstanding begin to clear the truth of who he is and the gift he wishes to give. She knows and says that the Messiah, the Christ is coming. And even though Jesus says, I who speak to you am he, there is still a little while to go before she takes that final step from fascination to faith and begins to walk with Jesus refreshed and renewed by the living water. But there is little doubt that it is already a changed person who rushes back to the town, leaving her water jar behind. And did she do that because in her excitement she simply forgot? Or did she do it because she was beginning to grasp that the water to which Jesus referred was something more? One could wonder what the inhabitants made of the excited and joyful individual suddenly insisting that they come and meet this stranger. Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. When we encounter Jesus, he can tell us all that we ever did because he knows us for who we are. Crucially, he knows one other thing. He knows what we are meant to be and what we are meant to become. We will pause for a brief moment here and when we come back, we shall move from the tears of our Lord to something even more profound. Welcome back to our Lenten Reflection. Through the living water that Jesus offers, he restores us to the image and likeness of our Heavenly Father. He gives us back our true selves, our true identity. How the world thirsts for that knowledge, but without realising it. In so many parts of the world, God is receding further and further back in the rear view mirror, with tragic consequences for society. One of these is the sense that identity is not something God given, but something we can invent or manufacture for ourselves. The story of the Samaritan woman reminds us that when we gaze upon Jesus and accept him as Lord and God, we gain true freedom. St Paul writes, in the letter to the Romans, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. Paul's own thirst, his awareness of the chasm between himself and his Lord, is laid bare. And he recognises what the Samaritan comes to recognise, 
that the distance that we have created through sin can only be bridged by the grace of the Lord. Although this complex and rich narrative is only recounted in John's Gospel with no parallel in the other three, there is so much local detail in this story that we can be sure that the woman at the well was undoubtedly a person whom Jesus encountered and who in her turn brought many in the community from which she came to Jesus. St Augustine of Hippo also saw in her a figure of the church not yet justified, but now about to be justified. St Augustine wants us to hear ourselves in that woman, to be thirsty for the water of life, to journey towards Christ, and then to walk with him who is the way, to know our need of him who is the truth, that he and only he can give us what is necessary for eternal life because he is the life. Jesus, as he waited by the well, tired and thirsty, is not only thirsty for physical water, he thirsts for us. He thirsts for our faith. He thirsts for us so much that he enters the world, hostile territory. He was in the world and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The Samaritan woman received him, believed in his name, and became a child of God. And Jesus takes his thirst for our salvation with him to the cross, a thirst that began at the sixth hour in Samaria and at the ninth hour on Calvary was quenched with vinegar. In his death, he is revealed definitively as the one whom we worship neither on Mount Gerizim in Samaria nor in Jerusalem, but in spirit and truth. Here Jesus is revealed as the rock from which the water flows and as the temple which is rebuilt in three days. The point of the cartoon with which I began is that the character in it was looking for the wrong thing. He didn't need a corkscrew, he needed water. Many people are deeply aware of something missing, of a thirst for something, whatever that something is. Often enough, we go looking in the wrong place, or for the wrong things, or in the wrong way. The water that Jesus offers us goes quite literally to the heart because it comes from his heart, a heart which burns with love for the world he came to redeem and save. And he waits patiently by the well, thirsty for our salvation, waiting for us to draw near, however lost we are, however sinful, to see with eyes of faith and know who it is who is speaking to us and to tell us all about ourselves. The story of the Samaritan woman is a story of salvation freely offered to the whole world. When Jesus enters into our lives and when we let him tell us everything we ever did, the good, the bad and the ugly, our lives change. Not only do we see Jesus and with the eyes of faith cry out, my Lord and my God, we then look on others in a new light and see in them the dignity of those made in the image and likeness of God. In those washed in the waters of baptism, we see brothers and sisters, co-heirs with Christ, and ancient enmities are healed and barriers broken down. And with them, and alongside the Samaritans whom the woman brought to Christ, we can say, we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the saviour of the world. Thank you for joining us. Please join us again next week for our EWTN Lenten series when Father Benedict Keeley will reflect on the Mass readings from the fourth Sunday 
of Lent. Yeah.